once in 1989 on Wea Island in the Yasawa group of islands, and then again in the year 2000 at Turtle Island. Uh, so yes, I, I, it's a lovely, erotic, exotic place, and I have been here. So uh, I like it. Um, I've actually kind of down made my presentation smaller. I'm really going to be talking a lot. Uh, not so much about, uh, Ted was talking yesterday about the hotels of the future and the rooms and controlling air conditioning and viewing stuff on things. And I, I'm really more interested in the food and beverage side of things. And, and I'm going to be talking from that point of view of how do you get people into your restaurants, your bars, your cafes? How do you get them to stay there? And how do you get them to spend more money? So that's kind of my focus. So it's very, very narrow. So some of the exhibitors, if you miss out on some other things, that's, I'm sorry about that, but I'll come back and talk about it later. The first thing, and I used this slide, Peter, you would have seen this one in Shanghai. Uh, Ted's stats yesterday were a bit outdated. He was talking from 2010, and the internet runs in dog years. One year of real life is seven years of life on the internet. So the actual sales of smartphones in the world close of 2011 last year was 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion smartphones were sold, right? That's more than all the desktop, laptops, and tablets combined. So these things have made a huge impact. Your average five-year-old can operate a smartphone today. They can play games on it, they can talk on it, they can do FaceTime and see people with it, but they can't tie their shoes. Right? So that's the reality of what's happening in this space. And it's very, very important, and I'll talk, the average, 70% of Australians go to sleep with their phone. 80% of women say they'd rather lose their car keys than their phone, right? So these things are very powerful. The guy that made a lot of this stuff uh, important was Stephen Jobs. Um, he's got a three-screen strategy. You heard a little bit from Ted yesterday about ITVs, but you've got your iPhones, your iPads, uh, MacBook Airs. I've got all the toys. I've got every single thing he sells, right? <laughs> but let me give you a statistic. In the last quarter of last year, October, November, December, 37 million iPhones were sold. That's more than the amount of children born on the planet. And sex is a hell of a driver. Right? There are more of these phones sold in the last quarter than people born on the planet. Right? So these things aren't going to go away. Now, where are people using these devices? In cafes, you know, when they're sitting there, and by the way, if you've got your phones here, you know how most people tell you to turn them off? Turn yours on. I don't care. <laughs> Tweet about it, right? So people are using them in cafes. They're and I actually have a problem with the concept of calling these a smartphone because we don't talk on them. The most use of the device is for texting. Texting far exceeds telephone calls on phones by a factor of two to one. So people are sitting there texting and sending messages to each other. If you call my voicemail, do you know what it tells you? Don't leave a message. Send me a text. Right? So that's where the world is going. So we're texting. What else are we doing? We're checking emails. We're doing searches to find out information. Right? But we're not talking on these devices. Right? Is that your experience? A few nods. What does Peter say? It's an interactive thing. That was a question. Anyway, right? same sort of thing in restaurants. People are sitting there in restaurants and they're using their phones. Right? Has that been your experience? Do you see that? It's important. And in bars. Right? Gen wires will sit in a bar drinking to get together and they're texting each other rather than talking. It's true. Why not look up and just actually talk to the person you're sitting next to? It doesn't happen. <laughs> so my point as I go on is I'm going to be talking about how you can leverage this. This is the way the world used to look, and this is the way I used to talk to people about it. In the old days, it was, you know, you had to have a website, www.yourcompany.com. You then had to go and do things like search engine optimization or pay-per-click advertising to drive traffic to it, right? You had to claim your listing in Google Places, and everything was Google, Google, Google. Is Google God? The short answer is yes. In Australia, 94% of people use Google as their default search engine. 94%. You know? Who's number two? Who cares? It happens to be Bing, which stands for because it's not Google. 
<laughs> and 2% use those idiots senseless that make yellow page some sort of books that people used to use for telephones. I don't know what those things are. Right? And that was the world. The world was all Google. Google controlled the world. And about four or five years ago, Mark Zuckerberg came along with Facebook. It's the only company on the planet that scares Google. And the reason for that is because the average person does searches on Google for about two minutes a day. And once they connect to Facebook, they're there for 20 minutes. They're checking out their friends, they're watching videos, they're engaging. And what's happened is we've gone from what used to be an algorithmic search environment to a social search environment. And let me give you an example of that. You know, in the past, if we were going to go buy a hybrid car or something, we'd put hybrid car reviews into a Google search engine and read some reviews. Now we don't do that necessarily. We'll go on Facebook and we'll post a message to our friends saying, hey, I'm thinking about buying a hybrid car. Should I buy a Chevy Volt or a or Toyota Prius? Right? And your friends give you that feedback. And the shift over the last five years from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the screen has been about a 30% shift. So about 30% of the people now who are looking for answers to their questions aren't asking a machine, they're asking their network of friends and people. Has that been your experience? Have you started to see that happening? Oh, shut up. Okay. <laughs> By the way, and, and everything else I'm going to talk about, the things that I want you to do today as you leave, as Peter would say, make some efforts, do some work, are predominantly free. They're free in cost, but they're not free in your time, right? So all the social media, and the other thing I like about being in this part of the world is we don't get any crap, right? We got Facebook. Who cares about MySpace? Sorry, Rupert, you lost out there, right? We've got Twitter. I don't even know who's there other than Twitter. We've got YouTube. You don't have Vimeo, which is popular in America. You've got LinkedIn. But you don't have Plaxo. So you only get the best of breed here. So the only, there's only a few that you have to worry about to be meaningful because all the secondary players aren't here. Okay? It's funny because I've got a lot of Gen Yers and young people that work for me. It's the only way I can keep up with all this crap. Um, and they have, you know, their, <laughs> I was in the space program, so their desks look like the Council of Shuttle. They've got three or four monitors. Facebook's up on one of them. YouTube's on another one. They're tweeting. They're doing all this stuff. I look at them and I say, you twit face. Because <laughs> they're the biggest time wasters on the planet, right? But they're powerful tools. Now, when it comes to food and beverage, this is the environment you really start to see, right? Trick question. What's the second largest search engine in the world? YouTube. YouTube. No, YouTube. The correct answer is YouTube. There are more searches done on YouTube than Yahoo, Bing, anything else combined, right? It is. There are 48 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. 48 hours. If you want to find anything, go onto YouTube and do a search. You'll find somebody cooking something. You'll find them changing a carburetor in a car. There's nothing you can't find that's there. Trust me, if you do, I'll be surprised, right? So YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook are the big players in the world. When it comes to food and beverage, the next three big places where foodies hang out are Yelp, Urban Spoon, and Foursquare. And for the most part, they're not represented in Fiji. They don't have a presence here yet. This my guy from the Cook Islands here that I was talking to the other day. But you've gone and created some Yelp stuff in the Cook, haven't you? Foursquare. Foursquare, yeah. right. OK. I'm going to talk about all these applications in just a moment. Right? So a, a lot of those aren't available here. But you do have Google Places, Pinterest I'll talk about, TripAdvisor, and one of my favorites, which is food spotting. Right. Uh, I'm going to deviate just for a second. Somebody asked me one time, you used to be in the aerospace industry. You used to be a rocket scientist. What the hell are you doing with search engines now? The short answer is there's only four countries in the world that have a search engine. America that has Google and Bing. The Russians that have Yandex. Chinese that have Bandu, and the Koreans that have one that I can't pronounce. Right? Those are the only four in the world. There are 20 countries that have a space program. Right? Japan's got one. The European Union's got one. Brazil's got one. It's a lot easier to put something into orbit than it is to run a search engine that indexes all the world's information. So 
So let me just go through here for a couple of slides. This is Yelp. Yelp is a big one, like I said, in, in Western European countries in America. It's not available here. And it tells you where things are around you and you can check in. This is Urban Spoon. Urban Spoon is huge, but there's nothing in the Asia Pacific in here. You got US, Canada, UK, it's not here. And then when I did Foursquare and I tried to check out Fiji, there aren't a lot of results for Fiji. So that was kind of a bummer, particularly in the place of Foursquare. Because you have to understand, Foursquare is a software application that lives on my iPhone, and it allows me to check into places. And when I check into places, I get points, and I get virtual badges. And if I checked in a lot, I become the mayor. And if I check in more than that, I become, if I go to a lot of different com countries, I become an ambassador. How cool is that? What you don't understand is, Gen Wires value those virtual badges and trophies more than stuff in the real world. They do. To them, it's very, very important. Right? I'm not kidding. But we do have Google Places. Right? Now that's free, and you can claim your listing in Google Places, and you don't have to be, uh, I've got a slide here. This is one for uh, Weston. So they've got a page in Google Places, which costs nothing, but you should have one for each one of your restaurants and bars. It costs you nothing, and it allows you to put up hours of operation, payment types, um, 10 photographs, five videos. You can put up even discount coupons, right? Very, very powerful, and it gets you indexed in Google, and it gets you on the front page of a search, and it costs nothing. And it also powers searches that are done on handheld and mobile devices. If you do a search from a mobile phone, you won't find your website, you'll find your Google Places listing. It has prominence. Right? And here's a Google Places search that I did on my iPhone. So that's how it works and how it comes up. So there are some places that have been found here in Fiji. So go and claim it for your restaurant and your bar and your cafe. You can do this. This is Facebook. This is Facebook for this conference, right? It's not even a, well, it's a place. I mean, we're here, but the point is you can have a Facebook page for an event, for a band, for your restaurant, for your bars, and you can check in and let people know where you are and what you're doing. The average Facebook user has about 130 friends. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't, I'm not sure I even know 130 people. But my show's friends, I can count on one hand. But the point is, people that are flying on Facebook actually like to share their experiences around the world. Because what else can they do? They can't eat anymore, they can't drink anymore, they can't buy any more stupid cars. So the only way they can differentiate themselves from their friends and neighbors is to say, here's a picture of me. I'm in Fiji. This is what I got up to this morning. This is what I ate. And they want to share that. And that's part of their experience. Their vanity and bragging about what they do is important to their identity and to their life. So you need to make that an opportunity for them. Does this make sense to people? They really want to share that experience. And Facebook is a great way to do it. That was shared in Fiji when I was here in January doing some research. Um, and here's, here's the Facebook page as it shows up on my iPhone. Right. Does this make sense to people? TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor, not one of my favorite uh, applications for reviews. And the only reason is people are actually paying other people to write bad reviews and to, to destroy your reputation. I think you need to look at TripAdvisor and monitor it and try to push those bad reviews off the front page. I mean, here I did, again, a search here in Fiji. That's what it looks like on my mobile phone. But unfortunately, there are people that are pranking the system. And that's not right. They shouldn't really do that. But again, a lot of people refer to TripAdvisor to get information about where they want to go and what they want to do. Right? And it is relevant here. So you can do that. This is my favorite. This is Food Spot. Food spotting is a very simple little app. 
lives on here, and I can see already when I did my search in Fiji, there are a lot of locations where people are going in. What you do is you actually use your phone, and you go someplace, and you have a dinner like you did out last night, and you take a picture of what you've eaten, and you upload it. That's cool. And that gets a lot less cranky because there's actually a photograph. And these things have GPS in them, so they know where you are. So it's, it, it tags where you were, what you were doing, what you were eating, and then you can say something about it. The thing to remember, though, is that more and more people, particularly the international travelers, they've come halfway around the world to be here, right? They really want to share that experience. They want to tell other people what happened. Does this, am I making sense to people? You need to facilitate that, because if you want to create a buzz about your restaurant or your bar or your cafe, let them do that sharing. Let them get involved with what's going on. Let them participate in the event. But what happens? What happens is I'm going to leave here on Sunday, fly back to Australia, and I'm going to get my telephone bill. And it's going to be data roaming charges. And it will have cost me $500 for the four or five days that I've been here. Because while I turn on data roaming on my phone, so I want to upload my picture to food spotting, I want to tell all my friends who aren't as cool as I am that I'm in Fiji having a great time, and I upload that photograph, and that all uses data roaming charges. Right? And it's expensive. And anybody that comes here is an international traveler. So what do I look for? I look for a Wi-Fi. I look for a Wi-Fi hotspot. Why? Because I know if I can go to the Wi-Fi hotspot, I can go to my phone, I can turn on airplane mode, I can go down to the network, I can turn data roaming off, I can turn Wi-Fi on, and I'm rocking it. Right? I'm having a good time. Because I can now broadcast my joy and my vanity to the rest of the world. But you can't do that unless you enable this for me. Right? These guys make squillions because no matter where you go in the world, they provide free Wi-Fi. Now, I don't mean to pick on any one establishment here on Denera, but I'm going to anyway. There's a little glass room in the Sheridan where I gotta go in to go and get Wi-Fi access so I can connect my iPad or my MacBook so I can go and do things online, and I'm in this little shithole of a room. <laughs> if they put Wi-Fi in the bar, because of my behavior, they'd make $100 an hour. I'm a functioning alcoholic, and you guys make all these cool drinks with colors and the blue and green, and a drink of the day, and I want to drink all seven days in one city. Right? Because it's great. Wonderful, I figure it's healthy, right? Because you've got fruit on it. <laughs> but instead, they put me in a little glass box. Why? Why do you do that to me? It's just wrong. And it makes it hard for me when I'm actually in. I can't, you know, I've got to remember when I leave the restaurant where I've taken a picture of my meal, I then have to go into this little glass box so I can upload it. Otherwise, I've got to pay squillions of dollars. There's another company around the world that does it pretty well. Starbucks, you know, they invented the $5 cup of coffee, of which I can drink three or four in the morning with the hangover from the night before, when I was in the bar with the Wi-Fi. But they want you to stay there, because what do you do when you stay there? You eat, you drink, you share it, you tell it to other people. So, you know, I don't understand why this isn't available and why the positive, the ROI exists. The return on investment is simple to analyze. You know? Security is an issue. It's an issue for me. I don't particularly like free Wi-Fi, and I'm going to try to pull this back together in a second. Uh, because if you have free Wi-Fi where you don't even have to put in any password, anybody that's a geek like me can figure out how to log in while you're logged on, and I can read all your contacts and do nasty things like Rupert Murdoch did, and, get on your phone and do all sorts of things. So you need a security password. The password can be the same for everybody, it doesn't matter. It just engages HTTPS and all these alphabet soup that geeks talk about. But it keeps stuff encrypted and safe, right? Now why is that important? 
because, um, well, it's important because you need to be safe. I'll come to it in a second. The other thing we need to remember, too, is Google, as much as they hate Facebook and Twitter, they own YouTube, they do indexing. How many people in the room have Googled themselves? Half the room is lying. You all Google yourself. Right? If you Google yourself and you have a presence on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter, you'll find out that you'll dominate the whole front page of Google. If you Google my name, and I used to have a slide doing that, that's a lot of vanity, so I don't do it anymore. Sure enough, my Google Plus page shows up. My Facebook page shows up. My Twitter profile shows up. My LinkedIn profile shows up. My YouTube videos show up. And if somewhere in there is my website. Because Google values that. In the past, when you had websites, you had to get a lot of people to link to you to get them to show up organically. Now, links aren't, the, aren't that important anymore. What is is likes and reviews. So you need to encourage people to review your establishments. You need to encourage them to like your establishments. You need to, you need to get them engaged with what's going on. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah, good. This is how I suggest you do it. The humble table tent, and Trevor will design you one that's attractive and suitable. And make maybe, a dance to go with it, yes. <laughs> maybe it'll uh, More. centerpiece. That's it, that's it. Is that okay? Can we have that? Can we have a centerpiece? Yeah. Right? Okay. Right? And then this other little thing sitting over here, this thing called a QR code. Now I can scan that with my phone, and it will then do something. If you happen to scan this one, it takes you to the South Pacific Food and Wine Festival. Right? But I can have that QR code take me to any place on the internet. It's 100% free to create them. It could link through to a profile on the chef. It could link through to a YouTube video of the catching and getting local produce or fish. It can, it can link to whatever you want. You can have 10, or 10 of these on a, on a table tent if you want. It can link through to a Facebook page where it says like us. Because if you do, we'll give you your second cup of coffee for free. You can incentivize QR codes, right? It's a way, so the person doesn't have to sit there on these little damn screen with my fat fingers after three martinis. It's a very hard to type in facebook.com stroke da 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 da. That's hard for me, but just to scan it, it's got all correct, works really good. It will take me to wherever you want to take me, right? It can be a special, it can be anything that you want. So I highly recommend that you employ the establishments that you're in to provide Wi-Fi access where I'm having the experience so that I can share that experience with my friends and family around the world. I may be doing it because of vanity, but I'm creating a buzz. I can then go to a Facebook page. I can like it. I can then go to TripAdvisor because you can link through to them if you want. And I can give you a thumbs up. I can give you likes. I can give you five-star ratings. All of those things, those reviews and likes, influence the social palette of where people decide to go when they're thinking about going out, eating, or drinking. I can link through to a guy's picture and what he's smuggling. Now, I've talked a lot about social media. I think you need to participate in it. It costs you nothing. I can tell you a couple of things right now. You do not have enough time in your life to maintain and operate social media. It's not possible. You need to outsource it. You need to find one of them little buggery gen wires, park them in a corner with a six pack of beer and let them loose. They'll get it done in about a half hour, right? Spelling errors included. But you will never have enough time to do it yourself. You're gonna to need to get other people involved. But the thing that's so cool about social media is, once you set it up, here's the rules. You should only spend about 30% of your time talking about yourself and, and who you are and what your restaurant establishment does. And you should leave the other 70% of the time for the people that are in there to make their comments and contributions to it. Right? I get to talk to, yeah, Glenn. With Facebook, from my experience, 
I don't have a Facebook page and I absolutely hate it. But it seems that people are telling their friends where I'm eating and where I'm drinking a cup of coffee. Like, do we really need to know all that crap? Oh, the question was, you know, there's people on Facebook saying where they're eating, where they're drinking a cup of coffee. Do you really need to know that crap? Uh, the answer is you and I are too old and we don't care. But the next generation does. And their whole image and persona is all about broadcasting their lives. So you, maybe not. Me, maybe not. Some of my ex-wives are fine. What is, the, what is the percentage of people that don't have a Facebook page? Almost nil. And the biggest growth group on Facebook is between 35 and 55. It's the freaking baby boomers who are all connecting to find out all of our friends from high school, see who got fatter, grayer, or balder, <laughs> and how many divorces they have had. Is what, 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 went, what, what, went, what, what went wrong with us? <laughs> like seriously, why, why, why did it not interest us? Have they missed something? Yeah, you, you missed the boat. No, have they missed something? Because it doesn't, it w neither of us have a Facebook page and hate it. So is there a group of us out there that have missed this or have they missed us? There's a group out there that have missed it and you're just the, you know there's a bell curve and there's a small percentage at the front and then there's a small percentage at the back. You're at the back. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm fat and happy. <laughs> it's, it's an excellent question. Uh, but it's not going away. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's only growing and you need to participate in it. And even if you won't participate in it, Oh, I'm nervous and excited for you. I hope you're feeling better. Go, you've been saying that's that, that's the uh, current girlfriend. <laughs> Tex texting me. <laughs> is that cameo? <laughs> I didn't point that. Um, but my point is, um, it's going to it's, it's growing. You can't avoid it. The social media environment's there. Now, having said that, and it's powerful. I want to show you some data that still is the most underlying, most potential, and most powerful online marketing activity on the planet, and that's the humble email, which everybody thinks is dying and that email is dead. No way. Well, you're all freaking wrong. Here are the numbers. And I, maybe I can, I can try to read some of them, right? What does it have to, by the way, if this chart was actually in scale, email chart would drop down to the floor and go up to the ceiling. There are three times as many email accounts as there are Facebook and Twitter accounts combined. Right? The total, total uh, posts on Facebook and Twitter combined add up to less than a quarter. If you add up all the searches on Google and Bing, all the page views, all the web traffic combined, and put it all together and multiply it by four, you get the amount of emails that are sent every day after subtracting 3 328 billion emails a day, that's after you take out 128 billion that are spam. Monty? Yo! You said earlier that out of all the countries that had um, space programs, there were only four countries that had search, search engines. Then out of those four countries that have search engines, if the two biggest search engines are owned by the one company, how do we know the information is not bullshit? Could they just not tell us what they want? <laughs> yeah, fortunately there are independent auditors. Okay, is that how that? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. That's a legitimate question. And by the way, uh, while Google and, and Yahoo, not, not Google, Google and YouTube are the two biggest search engines, Yandex is dominant in the Russian market, uh, and more so than Bing, uh, and more so than Google. And in China, Google is banned. So Bandu is huge. Um, so it's, it's not like there's a world domination thing here. So the information is accurate? It is accurate. Yeah, Tom Scorer, Nielsen, all these people. The nice thing about everything I do on the internet, by the way, is it's 100% it's audible. So, I mean, so if anybody in this room, if your BS detector goes off, you think I'm just pumping out crap, stop me, because it's all evidence-based. I can go online, I can go to ComScore, I can go to Nielsen, and I can say, here are the audited data. So it's not, it's not, not this isn't my opinion. This is fact. You need to participate in this space. It isn't going to go away. But having said that, don't forget humble email. Email is still open. It's still read. Build your list. It's a very, very powerful thing to do. Okay, does that make sense? Any other questions in the room right now? Okay. I got one. I'm unusual. Yeah, yeah. I got one. Let's give him a mic.
Lynn Austin is not part of the show, by the way. Try turning it on. Yeah. <laughs> you pay extra for heckler. It works way better if you turn it on. I know. When, when people say, like, don't tell me, who, who is they? And, you know, people think yeah, there needs to be some substance behind that. I have a lot of colleagues that are saying to me that their friends, lots of people, are walking away from Facebook. What's your opinion on that? And like, in droves. Yeah, um, I'll give you the data. Facebook has 850 million users worldwide. The majority of them now outside of the United States. Uh, 500 million of those were active in, in one day. Your average Facebook user does interact with Facebook 20 minutes a day. Google came out with Google Plus because they're scared of Facebook. They're trying to get into the social media. They blackmailed everybody on the planet to get into Google Plus because if you try to get any Google account, or Gmail account, or anything, by default you get Google Plus. So unless you turn it off, it won't go away. It was launched last June. It's now at 900 million users. It'll be 400 million users by the end of the year. Time on site, nobody's using it. They've got the accounts, but they're not using it. Facebook, just getting ready to IPO. Valuation, $100 billion on a company that turns over $4 billion. Google turns over $40 billion and has a valuation of $200 billion. So they're half the valuation of Google at a tenth of the revenue. It is not going away. They rolled out Timeline, which is, you had no choice about whether you wanted it. They're scrapbooking your life from the time you're born till forever. People hate Timeline until about day three and then they fall in love with it because it allows them to keep track of their whole life from the time they were born till forever. They're collecting this vast amount of information. Young people, you worry about privacy. Young people don't. They don't buy music, they don't buy TV shows, they don't buy movies, they just download it all for freaking free. So if Lady Gaga ain't to her turn, she's starving. Right? Because they don't value intellectual property. They also don't value their privacy. I mean, I tell my son, he's 19 years old, I said, I got only one rule about Facebook. Don't do anything on it you wouldn't do in front of your mother. Well, I'm amazed to see the things that he will do in front of his mother. Thanks. <laughs> They've got no shame. They've got no shame. And when he was a young lad, I laughed. He was at a school in Brisbane, and he went to a school dance, and they all went there with their phones, and the school didn't want people taking pictures of other people getting into trouble and doing stuff, so they made them put all their phones in a bin before they got to go to the dance. They got to the dance, they met a girl. They couldn't take down her phone number because they don't have paper and pencil. <laughs> and, they could, and they couldn't remember it. So they're all in a panic. Who's got a pencil and paper? Nobody uses a pencil and paper anymore. That's ridiculous. It isn't going to go away. You can't avoid it. So go with the flow. Engage with them. Make it easy. Ask them to do something. It's about doing, Peter, isn't it? Absolutely. There was also a case recently in America, we were involved in um, the Facebook, where someone had put up their opinion and they actually weren't allowed to graduate from university. Sure. Um, so that obviously becomes a problem as well. Like, you know, you might have your own opinion, but it can also um, impact on your career in the future, whatever you're writing now. And that's what they're not realizing that you know, it might be fun now, but then 10 years down the track and you've got a history to be. be you're absolutely future. right, Trevor. And I, and I can tell you right now, there are most companies now will look at somebody's Facebook profile before they employ people. So if you've been on a public and you, you know, you're showing pictures of you vomiting at five different establishments, it's probably not a good hiring thing. There was some dumb woman who posted on Facebook, I'm hung over, I'm not going into work today. And of course, her boss was looking at that, and they sacked her, you know, because she called in on a sickie, right? But again, the next generation has a different concept of privacy and what doesn't, doesn't play. Because I'm just going to ask um, Monty, uh, this information is so important and relevant to all of us that we can just keep questions and answers till the end of Monty's presentation. Otherwise, uh, okay. Uh, may I uh, cover all of that? I want to uh, I want to share with you a story. I have only told this story once before in my life. It was over two decades ago, and I cried, and that might happen again. It's all right, wait here for you. 
I used to work in the space program. In ninth, January of 1986, it was a cold January morning. I was a young lad, half my age now. I was sitting in a place called the Satellite Test Center in Sunnyvale, California. And they were getting ready to launch STS-25. That's the shuttle transportation system. That's the way the military evaluated and put the numbers from Cape Canaveral. The U.S. military called that the Blue Shuttle because there was a Tetris satellite inside of it, which is a telemetry data relay satellite. And I was in California monitoring the health and feeding of that satellite in the bay of the space shuttle, STS-25. It was a cold January morning, and the shuttle took off. And it throttled up to 103%, and it was a minute and 31 seconds into its flight. When the O-rings leaked, and the hot gases came through to the body and the belly of the space shuttle and exploded the main tank, killing all seven astronauts on board, which included the public for the first time, a civilian school teacher. Now my point about that story is, they didn't all die. It took a minute and 31 seconds to reach that altitude. There was a young Air Force captain named Captain Anazuka, Japanese American. We had telemetry sensors not only on the satellite but on the people. He and one other member of that crew were still alive after the explosion. He moved and did everything in his power to try to recover the tumbling of that shuttle on its way back down. It took two hours, or two minutes and 32 seconds for the shuttle to fall down the altitude it had risen. His life ended when it impacted in the Atlantic Ocean. But he was trying to do something the whole way. They renamed this place where I worked on Azuka Air Force Station after him. My point on that story is he didn't give up. He had discipline. He didn't panic. He was trying to fly the shuttle. There was nothing to fly. I'll take questions now. Stuff. They're hard to get along with. 
But if you feed them some beer and let them go, they can take care of most of this stuff for you. You can't do it. It's the four hour work. You need to outsource it. I, I mean, I've outsourced most of my life. I'm still trying to figure out how to outsource dieting and exercise. But other than that, everything else is done for me by somebody else. Hey, Monty. Yeah. You know damn well that we all do this stuff for a living and we're all professionals in what we do. I've got to tell you, mate, this is the best presentation I've heard in my life. Well done, mate. It is fantastic. Now i got to pay him. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Monty, thank you for the presentation. My name is Zach. Uh, I'm from OFI. I think uh, the fear that I have about using social media, or any media for that matter, is I know you've suggested 30% of the information about the company or what you do, but I think the fear is what information we actually put, which is going to be effective or non-effective, and that, you know, who do we use or what do we use? Yeah. That's a brilliant question. Uh, it truly is, because it allows me to do two things. Uh, one is, when you're in social media, it's, it's keep the sales and marketing people away from it. Because what you're really trying to do is create a discussion with your clients. I, it's funny, I get to, because of my reputation, I get, to, I get asked often to go into downtown Brisbane, which is the city where I live in Australia, and you drive down there and it costs you 20 bucks to park for an hour, and you, know, you get up to the top and there's some CEO who you know, drags you into some fancy conference room, and I start talking to him about all this stuff, right? When, when it used to be websites, you know, he'd say, well, this is what I want on my website, and I want my CV and my picture and this and that. I used to take him out to the front to the receptionist, and I'd ask the receptionist, has anybody ever come into this company and asked for his picture? Have they ever asked for his CV? Do they ever ask about your core values and your vision and your mission statement? The answer, of course, is no. I said, what do they ask for? Oh, they want to know the hours of operation. Is parking available? Uh, in, in food, it might be, do you have gluten-free? Do you have lactose intolerant stuff? I mean, that's, those are the questions. Always let the people that have the, the touch point with your customers um, determine what to say and what to tell them. And then these CEOs come and tell me, I mean, I really do this just to piss them off because it's a lot of fun because they don't employ me after I do these things, which is okay, right? But they come back and they say, well, we can't let our staff have Facebook. Jeez, if they have Facebook, they're going to sit on it all day and play and do all their stuff, you know? And what if somebody on it says something bad about us? And I've always done my homework because I walk in and I go, do you know what? People already say bad things about you and you don't know it. And I print it out. There it is. There it is. There it is. You've got nobody watching this. Have you seen the, the people that were tweeting about your services last week? You know, Richard Branson did it real well when the when the bill, when the air, online airline reservation system went to crack in Australia, and people were tweeting. They were stuck in this and that. He was answering those tweets within 30 minutes. Not him personally. He was answering those tweets. He does tweet personally as well, though. And they were answering the questions. The conversation is going to exist whether you decide to participate or not. Right? I get asked by people, they say, look, I do a Google search for my company and the fourth entry down says that I'm an idiot and a bum and an asshole and that. What do I do? Well, you can try calling Google and threatening to sue them and stop your foot. And Google will tell you, piss off, it's the algorithm, we don't care. Sue us if you like. What I tell them is, get more reviews create a LinkedIn profile, get a blog, push that comment off the first page. Because I used to lecture, and I still do a lot of lecturing on behalf of Google, and I used to say 80% don't go past the first page. Bullshit. 95% now don't go past the first page. And what's worse, you know that little mouse for scrolling? 85% of the people don't scroll. Unless, some, unless you're naked to hear, I'm not scrolling. <laughs> <laughs> because Google has taught me, her husband's left. Google has taught me that the answer is correct and it's in the upper left hand corner. I know where it is. I'm going to click on it. And they've made their ads, the color behind their ads has become fainter and fainter over the last few months. You can't tell it's an ad. 50% of the people that click on a Google ad don't know it's an ad. Right? But my point is you need to engage with them, not from a PR and marketing point of view. Not a hard sell. Not at all. 
It should be much more about you know, nutrition and health and atmosphere and this and that rather than one of the greatest five Michelin five hats or how many hats you get. Now nah, that ain't gonna do it. That ain't gonna do it. And let me go, let me continue along that track. You seriously need to engage and use video in, in on your Facebook page, uh, if, if, if on your Google Plus's page, because like I said, Gen Wires don't read. So you need video. If you don't include video, and this is not professionally produced video with cropped hair. And that, no, no, that turns everybody off. They want it to be real and gritty. Blair Witch Project stuff, handheld. Shoot it with your freaking mobile phone, right? I do a lot, a lot of videos because I practice what I preach. Everybody asks me, what software do you use to edit your videos? Good question. I use Wine. <laughs> I shoot the video, it's 45 to 60 seconds. If it's no good, I drink a glass of wine and shoot it again. <laughs> By the seventh or eighth time, it's either brilliant or I don't care. <laughs> you don't need to edit this, it doesn't have to be <coughs> backup sound music and, and bloody tight faces over the front and all that. You saw my slides, they're just pictures, I didn't have even have damn words on it. It, it's, it's that simple to get the message across. Have I answered your question? Yeah. Monty, uh, yeah. Matthew from Micros. Um, yeah. Related to that, I suppose, of, and not being too self-promoting on your content uh, and being more educational and consultative is, what, what are your thoughts then on blogging? Um, thoughts on blogging. Okay, that's an interesting one. Uh, the first answer is the blog platform of preference today is Twitter because it really is microblogging, and everybody can figure out 140 characters of something worth saying. Blogging does have some search engine optimization value. I won't argue that. Um, the point is, um, particularly if you have a website, Google has experienced a global financial crisis just like every other company. So what Google does is it sends a little Google bot to your website, it looks around and it goes, oh, okay, I'll index these pages, and then it goes off. Then it comes back next week, and it looks around and goes, oh, nothing's changed. I'll come back in a fortnight. Comes back in a fortnight and goes, eh, nothing new here. I think I'll come back in a month. And pretty soon you train it to never come back. So if you're blogging or if you have a blog associated with your website, when the Google bot comes back, it doesn't have to have a lot of content, but it says, ooh, fresh food. I like that. And then it'll come back and it'll, and it'll keep coming back. And if you're really good at it, you'll train the Google bot to never leave. It'll live on your website. So, so it, blogging can have value from that point of view. And the best blogging platform in the world to use is WordPress. It's search engine optimized out of the box, and it's 100% open source and free. So if you want to talk about that later, come see me. You know, how many websites do you want? They're free. Just a question about blogging, um, Monty. If you have a blog, how do you get people to come to your blog? How do you get people to, to comment on your blog? Right. Um, it's, it's, uh, the short answer to that is you bribe them. Uh, I call it an ethical bribe, uh, but you say, listen, um, thanks for visiting my blog. Uh, here is a, a recipe for chocolate mousse from our chocolate guy here. Oh, by the way, if you would like to download the other four recipes, I would like to comment here and when you get to the thank you page of that comment you'll get to the download page to get the other four and at the same time I'm going to ask for their email address as well um, so I, I, I bribe them uh, either with a white paper or a download or uh, secret sacred women's stuff they get to a separate private part of the site uh, all of those things are real to make people feel special that makes sense. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Yep. Thank you. Any more questions for uh, for Monty? Uh, just grab this. Um, early in your presentation, you talked about the importance of things like Foursquare and their growing importance. How how do you see things like that being important to places where you go to Turtle and you stay there for five or seven days? We only check in once. And that's it. Bullshit. Oh, I'm going to go in there and I've been taking a picture walking, I'm staying at the Hilton and every time I walk to breakfast I've been taking a picture every morning just to irritate my staff 
Um, and, and so it's, it's showing up on my feed and I'm pushing it in their face every day because my vanity knows no bounds. Um, and I take pictures of the cocktails and send them through. Now, I, mind you, I've run around with gin wires a bit too long. It's rubbed off a little bit. Um, but, um, I mean, even on Turtle, they've got theme nights where there's different things and they buried a pig and dug it up and that was one night. And, you know, there's horseback riding, there's scuba diving. It, it's just blatant broadcast vanity. So, um, yeah, you may only check in once, but you can actually check in like every day. It keeps you from checking in over and over on the same day to become the mayor. You can't do that. But you can check. I tried. <laughs> there's a way to find the system up there. Um, um, but there is something new and different. I mean, every time you wake up, it's a new day. Isn't it? And you're going to do two sit-ups and two push-ups. <laughs> Morty, well, don't start doing my stuff too, all right? <laughs> There's a part of Monty that is 57 years of age, but have you detected there's another part of Monty that's about 17 years old? <laughs> is there anybody in this room that's actually enjoyed Monty's presentation today? Do any of you let him know? Because sometimes we think you're so daunting and so complicated that body makes so simple for all of us. Uh, I will make a comment that it is only a one for the best presentation if you now go out and do something about it. So if it's just opening a Twitter account and you're not sure how to do it, ask the question. I'll remind you, what do I need to do more? What do I need to do better? What do I need to do differently? Because if you don't make that change when you leave this room, there will be no change. If this is important and you think it might be of immense value to you personally and to your business, you have the most wonderful opportunity. The fact that we are all together in this room this morning answers and ticks the, the yes box that I am interested and I want to grow personally and I want to grow my business. He is the superstar in this, in, in this, in this space. If you're not too sure how to, if it's a website that you need or a better website, then ask better questions. Who do I have to tap into that can help me grow and develop my website? If I'm not sure how to fuel, put it, you know, get onto YouTube and upload, that's me. I, I'm going to ask for help. If you go to Black Belt Next month or Peter Turin, I'm there. But could I do it better? I reckon I could. Is there anybody else in this room that reckons I could do it better? Anybody could do it better? Or well, stick your hand up and you can do it better? Yes. Yes. His name is Monty Hoops and he's going to be here today and tomorrow. We know where you'll find him. He'll be on a bar. If you're thinking why he'll answer questions for you, he's so easy to find. But remember, and this is right there at the top of my head space, Monty, don't do anything that would embarrass your mother. That's it. Right. <laughs> 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 it's my mom's birthday today. Uh, happy birthday to Monty's mom. What do you <laughs> There's an honest admission as well. An honest admission as well. Social media, it ain't going to go away. We need to embrace it. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Twitter. Facebook scares the crap out of me and I'm all right. Do I need to be on it, Monty? Yes. Do I need to do something about it? Yes. So then I get to ask better questions? Get one of your children to do it for you. Yes. <laughs> and just give me six pack of beers, all right? Body solves most of his problems with a six pack of beer. So, once so again, again, please, a massive thank you to Monty, everybody. <laughs> there is a Prezi for Monty, too, as well, but I'll give it to him off stage. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> We've just got a little bit of housekeeping, too. I, how can 